everyone, this is Oscar from Underdog, and today I am very proud to welcome you to my full course entitled Foundations of Electronic Music. This is a really big moment for me and I'm super excited to share this with you. I started teaching only a few years ago where I had no curriculum available to me. I had to invent everything from scratch. And what I did was I put in place a program which I call the Bootcamp. This electronic music bootcamp was a six week course and I would take absolute beginners who had never touched Ableton before and who had never made music before through all the basic skills to start making their own productions. I taught this course in real life to students for about a year, then the pandemic came, then I taught it online for about a year, then the YouTube channel got really large and I decided it was time that I put this course, that I take this curriculum and I put it into a format where it's much more widely available. And that's what you're looking at today. So this course is a course for people who want to start making electronic music. You don't need any skills to get started on this course. I assume that you have zero musical knowledge and that you have zero software skills that you don't know any music making software at all. And the idea is that we're going to start taking our very first steps, guiding you through programming your first instruments, your first elements, explaining the concepts behind all of it, the musical concepts, the theoretical concepts, and then introduce complexity little by little until you have a workflow that will enable you to finish your first productions. One of the biggest problems with self-learning electronic music is the lack of structure. A lot of the learning that you can find out there on the internet throws random information at you at random moments. And because you're still learning, you don't know what to pay attention to and what not. What information are you ready for and what information is not relevant for you just yet. And so in this course, I set up a structure. I give you a workflow and inside of the workflow, you'll understand where all the information fits and how to get better at each individual step of music production. That way you're not going to get overwhelmed, you're not going to get lost. And then after the course, you're going to have the vocabulary necessary to do your own research further and to go deeper in any of the different aspects that we've discussed. And so that's why this course is structured in two main parts. There is the core curriculum and the intermediate curriculum. So the core curriculum, I would say, it takes you about five weeks. Every week, it's a couple of videos and then some homework, some concepts that I want you to digest, to take away and to experiment with. And I would like you to take a few hours every week for those five weeks and practice the new concepts that we've introduced. And by the end of five weeks, you're going to be in good shape and you're going to know all the basic concepts that you need to know. Then you will have had the shallow tour of music production and then you have to go deeper. And then I provide the intermediate curriculum so people can explore various parts of music production a little bit deeper to go beyond just the essential basics. I like to say that this is an art class, not a software class. This is not really an Ableton Live course. Even though Ableton Live is the software that we're going to be using, I like to think of this as an art course or a music course. I want to give you the tools to create emotional and expressive art for yourself. The tools, yes, Ableton Live is a very good tool. That's what I'm going to use to show all the examples. But the concepts and workflows and structures in this course can be applied in any DAW. So concretely, let's talk about the core chapters. The first section is about getting to know your DAW, the audio editing skills and programming drums in there using audio and using MIDI. Once you've understood those concepts, I want you to take that away and practice for a while. I want you to create several drum loops so that you start to feel a little bit confident programming drums for your tracks. Depends on how much you practice, but about one week should be enough for this block. Then we're going to teach you how to start adding synthesizers to this and we're going to start teaching you a music theory framework. So you're going to start understanding a bit that you don't choose notes at random. There are some structures behind music that means that you can start making emotionally impactful music. That's quite a big chapter as well. And once you get to the end of that chapter, you're going to have to take another week to practice it and to digest it. So the first there's the drums, then there's the harmony and music theory. And then the third section is programming instruments with intention and sculpting their sounds to fit together into a song. We could maybe call this sound design for short, but there's a lot to this. So there's the question of understanding what kind of patterns each different instrument will play and then learning the basis of synthesis so that you can go into a synthesizer and not feel lost when there's all the overwhelming controls in there. That's going to take at least another week as well. So there's everything to do with drums, then the music theory or harmony, and then sound designing and programming your individual elements. And then the fourth part is the area called mixdown. 
That's kind of like the audio engineering role where you take all your musical ideas and you have to balance them together into a song and try to make sure that all your elements live well next to each other. We have to learn some sound engineering concepts for this and a new mental model of how to listen to music thinking in three dimensions. Understanding and practicing those concepts, I anticipate that's going to take another week again. So that's four weeks. And finally, up until this point, you'll probably have been applying all of these concepts working on a loop, an eight bar loop or a 16 bar loop. If that doesn't mean anything to you yet, don't worry, we'll get into that. But you'll be working in a loop. And then on the last week, we go into arrangement. And that's where you take that loop and you build in tension and release to make breaks and climaxes. And that's going to be the last chapter that also probably will take you about a week because arrangement is a dimension that can take a lot of energy as well. So plan about a week for that. But so with this framework, that's about five weeks. And if you follow along with that, you're not going to feel overwhelmed as new information is introduced. It's all going to fit into a framework. And along the way, I'm going to give you some diagrams and some charts so that you can have visual reminders of where you are in the process and how it all fits together. At some points, there are going to be some little quizzes as well, just so you can see if you've understood the concepts correctly. And then at the end of five weeks, congratulations, you are now basically a music producer. Now the question, of course, is going to be how to get better at music production. And I don't leave you alone there quite just yet. I provide you with a secondary catalog of videos that go deeper into various specialist topics that are related to intermediate music production. At some point along the way, you're also going to see some optional classes that if you feel like you can handle more information at that moment, you can watch these optional classes or you can skip them because they're not essential and you can come back to them later at a moment when you feel like you can handle some more information. And then finally, what I've also included is a few track analyses. So that's just a small collection of videos where we listen to music together and we talk about what we hear in terms of composition, what we hear in terms of arrangement and what we hear in terms of technical things as well. This is particularly fun because here I don't have to worry too much about copyright strikes, but on YouTube, I can't upload these kind of things because of copyright reasons. So that's a really nice bonus for this course. During the entire course, you can always come to our Discord channel. Discord is kind of like an online chat community where you can come and talk about your experiences. If you get blocked anywhere, if you have any questions, you can always come ask them there. And that way I can get the feedback. I can answer your questions. If necessary, I can update or fix the course on here as well. So future students will thank you. You can share your works in progress, give feedback on each other. It's a great accompaniment to your learning journey through this. So all that's left for me to say is good luck. I'm very excited for you. I really hope you enjoy it and I'll see you in the first videos. Cheers. Hey everyone, welcome to the first class in this series. It is an introductory class where we are just getting to know our DAW, also referred to as a DAW. That's short for Digital Audio Workstation. It just means whatever software you use to create sound or to capture sound or to mix sound, that software we're going to be using to create our music or our audio art. In this particular one, we're going to be using Ableton Live 11, which is what's open in front of me right now. Let's come to terms with what's in front of us right now. You see how the information here is laid out in these vertical bars like this. Whenever you click here, you see that a vertical bar like this lights up to be selected, right? And then over here on the right, there are a few more. Well, to understand what's going on here, I want to invite you to the metaphor of the audio mixer. Whenever people want to make audio engineering seem complicated, they'll show you a desk like this with a million buttons on it and say, wow, look, isn't that complicated? That must be rocket science. Well, actually, it's not that complicated. What you're seeing here is, in fact, a way of recording several instruments, mixing those instruments together into one master signal that goes out the other end. And they're organized in a fairly straightforward way. Every vertical line here represents one instrument or one sound source. You can imagine here at the top that the instrument's microphone gets plugged in. The audio then travels through it, gets hit by all these buttons, these effects on these channel. Then at the end, there's a slider which determines the volume of the channel. And then at the end of this little journey, all of these instruments get summed up or added up 
into the master, which is there on the right. Then on the master, there's one slider for the full volume of the entire mix. No matter how large your audio mixing desk, basically that is all it is. Larger mixing desks just can accommodate more instruments. There's nothing particularly more complicated about them than that. And so in Ableton, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at vertical strips like this, that each will represent one sound source or one instrument. A sound source, for instance, could be um, a drum or it could be a trumpet or a human voice. If you would identify it as one sound or one type of sound, it goes on one track or one channel or one strip. These are words that are being used interchangeably. Now, if you look up here, there are two different words here. There are MIDI and audio, right? These are two different types of strips that exist. And today we're only going to look at audio. So what we're going to do is we're going to select here at the top and we're going to delete and delete just by hitting delete or backspace on your keyboard. All right. This leaves only the audio channels right here. You can add new audio channels by right clicking up here and doing insert audio track. On Windows, there's also the shortcut Control T. On Mac, it's Command T. And you can make as many of these as you like. They just keep arranging like this. If you're on live intro, there's a limit to how many you can make. But in general, most DAWs have an almost unlimited amount of tracks. Now to simplify our life, let's select multiple. So from here, I'll hold down Shift all the way to here and hit Delete just to keep things clean. Now, another way to simplify our life as well is to look here on the right and look at these two vertical ones that are called reverb and delay, the one that says A and B. We're going to delete those for now as well. These in the future might become important to your workflow, but maybe not. These are called return channels and they, they're too complicated for today. We're, today, we're just gonna talk about audio channels to get our heads around that. So notice that these three channels here on the left get summed up into the master channel. And at the bottom of each of these strips, there's a volume knob here that goes up and down. So you can increase or decrease the volume of a sound. The normal, the neutral volume is zero and it goes to minus a number. We'll come back to that in a minute, why that is. And you can deactivate individual tracks like this by turning off the little button here. And you can solo different tracks, which means that you mute all the other ones and only listen to that track for a while. Okay, so let's unsolo, activate everything. So you have to understand that audio, it flows like water through tubes from one place to the next place to the next place to the next place. So it starts here and then it goes down through the volume slider and then into the master channel and down through the master channel and into the volume slider down there. Now, super important thing you need to know about Ableton is that there are two ways of looking at the same information, different views of this information that we just looked at. The one that we're looking at right now, this is called session view, but the most important one that we're going to be using for this introduction course is something called the arrangement view. And how to get to arrangement view? Well, you hit tab on your keyboard there. This this is a shortcut that you need to get into your fingers as soon as possible. This is essential that you are super fluent switching between these two views because you will be doing this nonstop for the rest of your production work in Ableton. But what is arrangement view? Well, arrangement view is just another way of looking at the same information, which is laid out vertically in session view, while here it's laid out horizontally in arrangement view. You can see here we have horizontal strips and it says one audio, two audio, three audio, the exact same way that it says it here. The same information is presented. If you bring down the volume of the middle one, for instance, down to minus 24, and you go to arrangement view, look over here, this blue thing now says minus 24. So this is the same thing. We've got these on off buttons, these solo unsolo buttons. This is all the same information. There's nothing new being added here. It's just laid out slightly differently. But what's wonderful about this view is that we have a timeline here. This is a timeline where time flows from left to right, kind of like in video editing software, if you've ever tried that. And the idea is that there is a playhead and it moves along the timeline and it plays whatever audio is beneath that playhead. So I can click anywhere and hit spacebar 
And that's the same as hitting play up here in the top. And as you can see, there's this playhead that moves across and whatever audio, whatever sound that we put on the timeline, it's going to play it out into that channel. And then that channel is going to go into the master. And then that master is going to go into your ears. So great, Spacebar also stops the playhead and you can click wherever you want it to start and then hit Spacebar to get started. So this is something that you also want to get in your fingers. We have Tab to switch around, we have Spacebar to start and stop. Super important essentials. Then the timeline. Let's look at the time divisions of this timeline. There are two ways of measuring time on the timeline. One of them is in seconds. All the way at the bottom here, you can see zero seconds, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, etc. So the timeline that we're looking at right now could be a composition of about two and a half minutes, let's say. However, up here, there's a different set of numbers. There's one, five, nine, 13, 17, 21, etc. These are called the bars. And bars are let's say one of the most logical musical subdivisions of your composition. If you think of the typical house or techno beat that just goes boom, 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 right? Where the kick drum just goes one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Well, we tend to count those in clusters of four because there are four beats to every bar in most house and techno. You want to internalize that as a starting point very strongly so that the measure of music, when it goes one, two, three, four, that's a bar. And so at the start, before we do any kind of big composition, we're going to want to compose one bar of music. So let's zoom in to one bar of music because this is way too much right now. So let's zoom in. And the ways to zoom in, there are a few different ways, but you can click up here in this gray area, wherever there's a little uh, hourglass, and when you click and you drag down, that's when you zoom in. On a Mac trackpad, you can also just zoom in with two fingers. You can also use the plus and the minus key on your keyboard. You can also hold down control and then the scroll wheel on your mouse to go in and out. However, for me, the most ergonomic so far has been to just click here and drag. So you click wherever you want to focus on and you drag in. And so as you can see, let's go from the first bar to the second bar. See that? So one to two, we want to be able to have a close look at what's going on within this one bar. So this amount of time is going to be in our composition, something like boom, 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 the end. All right, and that's what, something that we're going to loop over and over and over and over. So what we do is we select an area on the timeline that we want to loop, and we select from here to here, for instance. We can right click and do loop selection. This is Control L or Command L, which is another very, very, very helpful shortcut that you want in your fingers. So now when I hit play here, you'll see that it goes over and over and over again. We are now composing a one bar loop. Get used to zooming in and out. Make sure that you're not zoomed in too far, that you're not zoomed out too far. Find yourself comfortably one bar. This is going to be your home territory. This is where you know how to compose. This is going to be your starting point. Okay. Now you see that there's a lot of vertical other lines here, the grid. There's a lot of subdivisions on here, right? So you can choose exactly how subdivided this is. You don't have to uh, take this default setting. And what I recommend that you get used to is that you set it to 1 slash 16. That means that one bar is divided into 16 steps. This is kind of like some kind of magical number where most musically interesting decisions happen at the level of 1 16th. So when in doubt, come back to one bar, divide by 16, now you know where you are. Okay, enough orientation, let's actually put some audio on the timeline so we can see what happens when you put some audio on the timeline. Okay, so to put some audio on your timeline, we're going to need some samples, some audio samples, which is pre-recorded audio. And we're going to have to go here on the left side of the screen to Ableton's browser. Now, the browser has a lot of very useful sections that you're going to get familiar with one step at a time. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to scroll down below all of these other categories and look here at places. 
places is basically a place where you can drag in your favorites. You can place favorite folders there with samples that you can then access. As an accompaniment to this video, there should be a sample pack there that you can unzip somewhere on your hard drive, call that your samples folder, and that's going to contain all of your samples. And then that folder we're going to place here under your favorites so you can access it easily at any time. You'll either want to go to your Windows Explorer and find yourself a folder and drag it in here until you see this little black line show up. Then you can drop it there and it will add itself to the list. Or you can go to the bottom of places and do add folder. Then your finder or explorer comes up and you can simply select the folder that you want. Inside the folder that I gave you there, you should find a number of subsections and one of them should be called loops. And within loops, we'll find ourselves some TR-909 drum sounds. The TR-909 is a drum machine. We'll come back to that in the next class when we focus more on programming drums. But right now we're just going to do some drum loops and we're going to uncollapse this and look at all of these beautiful loops. So whenever you click on one of these loops, what you're going to get is you're going to get a preview. So see that? There we go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a kick loop and we're going to drag it in here, boom, and drop it on the timeline. Look at that. Now you can see the waveform of the audio represented through time like this. Let me zoom out to have a look how long this is. This is a two bar loop. In fact, let's work in two bars. That's fun. So to do that, you can just drag out the loop brace to wherever you want it to be, or you could select the two bars and do control L to set the loop like this. And then when we hit play, perfect loop. This will loop forever. Great. And so we can add a few different sounds. For instance, let's take a snare loop and put that on its own audio track. Awesome. Let's add some hi-hats. Great. This is a great starting point. We have a little bit of a start to a composition right here. So what we'll do for a moment is let's talk for a moment about the volumes. So when I hit play, you see here on the right, these green little bars are jumping all over the place, right? If I hit tab, you'll see here on session view, the same volumes, the same bars here are jumping all over the place. So, so that's good. Let's reset our volumes to zero to where they were at the start. And let's see what happens now. Okay, all the volumes are somehow at the same level right now, right? And all these green bars are jumping up very nicely. However, on the right, on the master, when all of these green bars get summed up together, you'll see that this little bar here turns red sometimes. See that? The reason for this is because zero, zero decibels, is actually the maximum volume for our signal. Let's talk for a moment about volumes in your DAW. You see that everything here is measured in negatives, right? So you start at zero and you go down below zero. Well, this is different from how you measure decibels in the real world. In the real world, outside of your computer, if you have a sound coming at you, that's really air pressure waves, right? And you can use an air pressure measurement device to measure how many decibels worth of air pressure is coming at you. So you could say, for instance, that the sound that you're hearing right now is 80 decibels worth of air pressure or way louder, it's 100 decibels worth of air pressure. That's calculating it in a positive way, right? However, here, what we're doing is we're working in a recorded medium. This is a recording of sound, and a sound recording has an arbitrary maximum amount that can be represented inside of the recording medium, and then you measure the distance from that maximum amount down to minus infinity. That's what we are working with right here. 
whatever decibels that that will finally translate to when it actually comes out of your speakers depends on the volume knob of your speakers, not of the recorded medium in itself. Zero decibels is the maximum that you can represent. And if you go over that, you risk something that's called clipping. Basically, there's a lot of different places in your audio signal chain where this can create a problem if you go over zero. And at the start in Ableton, you're not going to be punished very harshly for it. Uh, you're not going to hear the difference. But when you go outside of Ableton, when you render your audio into an MP3 or something, you're going to start getting into big problems. So what do we need to do to prevent this kind of clipping or audio problems? Well, we need to make sure that there is always some space between the loudest part of our signal and the zero, the maximum of our recorded medium. The distance between that is called headroom. We always want to have some headroom. That means that whenever this kick drum is playing, we want it not to be that close to zero. We want it to have like maybe six decibels, maybe 12 decibels, maybe even more of headroom. And so let's turn down all these other volumes. And first let's set the headroom on the kick. See that, this is up way too loud. You can see that it's peaking. This is a peaking meter at minus 0.2. So let's bring it down until it's peaking at maybe, maybe minus 12. Yeah, perfect. There you go. Now let's bring up the other volumes so that they sound relatively okay next to our kick. That sounds good. Great. You'll notice often that the kick tends to be the loudest element in your composition. So this makes sense that most of the other elements are quieter than the kick. And then when they are all playing together, now when we look at the master, there should be no red, there should be no clipping. See that? There is still some headroom here. There is some space for us to add more effects, add more processing, and we won't be going into the red. This is a healthy audio signal. Whenever you see these meters flashing red, you got to beware, be a little bit careful and maybe back off on the volumes a little bit until you have some headroom left over. Whenever you're affecting the volume in your DAW, another word that you're going to hear a lot is gain. Gain is just another word for volume, really. When you add some gain or you reduce some gain, that's all it is. Volume up or volume down, nothing else. Let's go back to arrangement view. Great. We've got ourselves some loops. We can add any number of loops that we want. If we just do control T, control T, keep adding audio and keep adding loops. So here's another one, the rim shot loop. And now it's way too loud, see? But we can also control the volume from over here. We can drag this down and I'm gonna start somewhere around minus 15, a little bit lower than the kick drum. Great, this is a good starting point for our composition. Great, it's already sounding pretty decent. Now there are a few more essential skills that I want you to know at this point. I want you to realize that each one of these is called an audio clip, right? And audio clips can be manipulated in a few interesting ways. For instance, imagine that you want this rim shot to only happen at the start here. What you can do is you can drag the edge of a clip here. See, don't click down here, but click at the top where there's this little ribbon and you can then drag it in to shorten it and only show part of the clip. This looks a little bit like you're deleting all the audio that comes behind it, but actually this is what's called a non-destructive operation. That means that it doesn't destroy the sound below it. It actually, it's right there. You can drag it back out. So, Clips, whenever you change something about clips, it doesn't destroy the audio, it stays there. So for instance, what I can also do is select this area on the timeline, delete it, and now I've got myself two clips that both of them contain the same information. I can drag this one back out and I can drag this one back out. It's all pretty flexible like this. So you should never hesitate to make edits on your clips like this. Now imagine that I want, instead of having this kick loop, I just want the first kick. What I'll do is I'll drag this in to the to over here and imagine I want it to be a really short kick. Well, there's a new thing that I want you to look at. When we zoom in and you hover over any audio clip, you'll see these little blocks showing up in the corners. 
right? These are handles to create fades on the edge of your clips. So you grab it here and there you go. And now you fade out the sound. So instead of it stopping abruptly here, it stops gradually. This is a super handy technique for when you are blending together various clips. You can shorten the length of whatever it is that you've got. And now what you can do to create your own drum loop here is to hold it down with control. You can copy it. That's option on Mac. And an alternative is that you could select this area on the timeline and do duplicate or control D or command D. Look at that. So now we've duplicated this and we've got ourselves a drum loop based on copies of just the first drum. Very short copies of it. Great. This is a super helpful technique so that now you have full control over your audio uh, and you are now an audio editor. I'll do the same here with the snare. Let me deactivate all the other instruments so we're not distracted. I'm going to create a really short snare here. So let's, let's make it really short. See what I'm doing here? I'm, I created a fade, hop, and I'm dragging this in as short as I can on the 16th bar loop. And now I'm gonna select this area on the timeline and do Control D, Control D and Control D. That way it aligns perfectly with the kick drum. And let's listen to that. Really short now. So I've used a loop as a starting point to create my own drum sounds and I've used fades to affect the audio in the way that suits me the best. One more keyboard shortcut at this point that I would like to give you is whenever you've got yourself a long clip like this, you can click anywhere in the middle and do control E or command E. This creates a split right there. And that's just an easy way to manipulate audio in various situations. So command E is just one to add to the list of shortcuts that you want at all times. So that's it. That is the first orientation in Ableton that I want you to take away and do a little homework for. I want you to find yourself some loops, use the sample pack that I provided, drag those loops into some audio tracks, create audio tracks, delete audio tracks, and create yourself a one bar or two bar or four bar loop, a short loop, and keep listening to it. Set the volumes to the appropriate level so you're not clipping on the master. Try using a loop as a starting point, but cutting and pasting it across and making little fades so that it suits your musical vision, not just the one of the loop creator. Try activating and deactivating various tracks. Try soloing and unsoloing various tracks and see if you run into any problems. If you run into any problems, leave them in the questionnaire below so that we can create an FAQ to troubleshoot your way through this. I'll see you all in the next class where we're going to talk about programming, drums and what are some strategies to program your own drum tracks that don't rely on loops. See you all in the next video. Cool, welcome back to the second session. Hopefully you are now acquainted with your DAW, your DAW, and you already have some basic audio editing skills in your fingers. A lot of the job of working in a DAW like this is similar to an audio editor. So those basic skills of navigating around the software should become second nature to you so you don't have to think about them anymore. We're going to be coming back to them again and again and again over the course of the course. So don't worry about it too much, but do try to get better and better at all these basics. Anyway, today we're going to be talking a little bit about drums and drum programming. And talking about drums, when I started producing, I, I don't have any background as a drummer, so I didn't know what kind of drum types existed. I didn't know how a drummer thinks. I didn't know any of that. So I had to kind of figure it out how to simplify it for myself. And so with the infinite number of options in front of you, I want to simplify it down to just a few basic variables that you have to think about and a simple way of starting to compose efficient drum lines for your song. Let's look at a real drum kit because that's actually what all of this is inspired on in the first place. This is what a real drum kit looks like and it looks like a lot of information, but there's actually in reality only three things that you need to pay attention to very, very closely. The first one is this big round low drum, which is called the kick drum or the bass drum. 
It's called the kick drum because you hit down, you kick down with your foot onto a pedal, which puts a beater into this drum and it creates this big boom sound. It is the thing that makes the dance floor move. It is the thing that hits you in the chest. It is the fullest, warmest, roundest sound in the drum kit. It's a wonderful thing and we're going to be using it a lot in our compositions. So the kick drum, we're going to call this the lowest drum, right? This is the, the drum that keeps the low end together. Then on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's the drum that keeps the high end together, which is called the high hat. That's this one right here. This is two cymbals that are resting on top of each other like this. And the drummer can choose if it's going to be an open hi hat or a closed hi hat. If the hi hat is open like this, when he hits it with his stick, the cymbals will resonate on for a long time. However, when it's closed, when he hits it, it just goes. Pssst. The sound tails off really quickly and becomes silent very quickly. So a hi-hat has two modes, open hi-hat or closed hi-hat. And together, these two things create the metronome of your beat. It's booms, 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 booms. These are the two most important sounds in your percussion uh, at all, right? These are the absolute two fundamental sounds that are going to propel the beat of your track forward. Often in dance music, you can also say that the kick drum falls on the downbeat and the hi-hat falls on the upbeat. That's if you think about how your head moves when you listen to something like this, it goes booms, 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 booms. Downbeat, upbeat, downbeat, upbeat, downbeat, upbeat. All right. So think about those words because later on they're going to help make sure that your track is danceable, that people can nod their heads along with it. Because at the end of the day, that's a very important listenability concern. You want to make sure that people can bounce their head with your music. Essential, okay? Now, if the kick drum and the hi-hat are the two most important ones, there is a third one that is the middle percussion, which is the snare drum. A snare drum, it looks very much like some of these other drums. However, it has a secret. Underneath the skin of the snare drum, there are some metallic wires that resonate out really sharply when you hit the snare drum. So it creates this splash of energy. That is the drum that holds down the middle of the song. In the most classic house beat that I want you to really internalize and just get used to as a good starting point, the, the snare drum plays on every second kick. So a one bar loop would first, without a snare drum, just sound like booms, 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 booms. Right? Four kick drums, four hi-hats, the hi-hats right in between the kick drums. And then the snare would hit on every second kick drum. So all together it would sound like booms, kits, booms, kits. This is the classic backbone of a lot of dance music. So use this as a starting point and then later on you'll be developing more complex drum loops. But this is the starting point and it is the thing that underlies everything else. Because if you get these three elements to be nice and predictable, the lows, the middle and the highs, if you get these to be a predictable metronome for your song, then every other element that you add on top of it can have quite a lot of complexity and your audience won't get lost. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using these three drums, which I'm going to call the core drums. And then we're going to be adding secondary percussion to that to create rhythmical interest and diversity. But these three core drums are usually going to be pretty stable and pretty predictable in what we're going to be doing in this bootcamp. So just to complete the names of what we're seeing here, we're also seeing some toms. These are these big drums that nicely complement the kick drum to create a groove in the low end. And we also see some splash cymbals right here, which are ways of adding energy, bursts of energy to the top end of your track. Uh, some of these are called crashes, splashes or ride cymbals. Now, Oscar, why are you showing me acoustic drums when I want to make techno or I want to make house music or I want to make hip hop? I'm not going to be using acoustic drums, am I? Well, you would be surprised. I want to introduce you to a technology that was then developed in the 80s to replace drummers. Imagine you had a band, but you didn't have a drummer and you needed an artificial drummer. Well, they created something called drum machines for that. And particularly Roland, a Japanese company, came out with some very legendary ones at the time. There was one called the Roland TR-808 and one called the Roland TR-909. These are drum machines where you hit play and you program in the pattern of the drums and it pretends to be a drummer, but with a rock solid tempo and a very strong machine-like predictability. 
Because they didn't do very well at actually mimicking what a real drummer does in a band, they were commercially not very successful at the start. However, after a small period of commercial failure, they were rediscovered by people who discovered that if you play these artificial sounding sounds to a dance floor through a very big amplified system, the dance floor responds super positively to them and actually loves these kind of synthetic sounds. It doesn't matter that they don't faithfully reproduce what an acoustic drum kit sounds like. And so since then, in electronic music compositions, these two drum machines, and many others, but let's use these as a starting point, these drum machines have been used again and again and again and again to create music that you are probably already very familiar with. So if you use the sounds of these drum machines, you're already going to be creating music that sounds kind of like the music that you are already familiar with. So that's a good starting point for learning. So we're going to be using the sounds from these drum machines. Let's use the sounds of the 808. And as you can see on the 808, you have here listed along the top all the different types of drums that are in there. And we'll recognize the names from what we already discussed. There's the bass drum, the snare drum, some toms, so the low tom, the mid tom, and the high tom. We have the rim shot. Rim shot we didn't discuss yet, but the rim shot is just a variation on the snare, where instead of hitting the skin of the snare, you hit the rim of the snare. It's just a short, very staccato, very tuck kind of a sound. Then there's the hand clap, which is a great sound. Obviously, that's not in the drum kit because you have to clap your hands, but here it's a, a sample. And together with the rim shot and the snare, you can see the hand clap as sort of one of the core mid-range elements. So whenever you were going to use a snare drum in a composition, you might also try using a rim shot instead, or you might also try using a hand clap instead. These are elements that are very interchangeable and very often stand in for one another. Then you have also a cowbell, that's kind of unique to this particular drum machine, it's a very iconic sound. You have the splash cymbal up at the top, and then you have the open hi-hat and the closed hi-hat there. That's it. That's all the drum sounds that you need to create a very rich and diverse beat. It's not an endless list of drum sounds. This for me was a comfort, because when I first started programming drums, I could see there were so many different types of drums, and I didn't know how to simplify things. So to simplify things, there are your three core drums, the kick, the hi-hat, and the mid-range element, which is often the snare, but could also be the rim shot or the clap. Those three are the metronome that the audience is going to orient themselves towards. Everything else is secondary percussion that adds to the groove. So let's jump into Ableton and create ourselves a drum groove based on these sounds. Cool. So we're in Ableton in a similar way to last time. We've got ourselves two audio tracks, and let's go directly to the arrangement view, and we'll zoom in and we'll get ourselves a one bar loop. So we'll drag the loop brace into one bar. And as you remember, we just want one bar because that's going to be equivalent to one, two, three, four in our song. Now we need to find ourselves some samples that are not loops. So we're going to go out of the loops folder, go into the drum samples folder, and find ourselves the one that matches the sound that we want. Now the 808 was used a lot in house and hip hop because it has very warm, round, clean sounds. And so it's used a lot in those contexts. The 909 has a much harsher, more metallic banging sound. And that's why it's used a lot more for techno. Don't consider those limits, of course. There are, of course, techno songs made with the 808. And there are, of course, house and urban songs made with the 909. However, it's a good starting point for you to start associating one with various genres. So let's go into the 808 and look at what we've got. We've got individual drum hits and they are labeled with the shortcuts like BD is bass drum, CL is clap, cowbell, cowbell, hi-hat is HH, rim shots, snares, and toms. Pretty straightforward again, right? It's not an endless list of drums, and we only need the three core ones, and we're going to be doing the bass drum first. So we'll select ourselves any bass drum, and we'll drag it into our timeline like this. We'll drag it onto the first beat of the first bar. Now, what are we immediately noticing? Well, it's a very long sample. It goes like this. Imagine we want this to be shorter, right? Remember your training. We can just grab the edge of the clip here at the ribbon, bring it in, and then we can bring it to however short we want. But now it's going to get cut off quite drastically. So let's listen to what that sounds like. Do you hear that? How it goes, and then it just 
shuts up immediately. That's not a natural tail for the sound. What we're going to be doing is creating a natural tail. So we create a little fade on the edge there, just like this. See how that feels. Okay, this feels more natural. So now let's copy this across four beats to the bar like this. One, two, three, four. Fairly straightforward. So now when I hit play, an endless loop, an endless great solid foundation for our track. And this is a great thing to start building on. Okay, let's add ourselves on every backbeat a snare drum or a clap. We can choose. So, which one do we prefer? Okay, imagine we prefer this one. Let's drag it in on every second kick drum. There we go. And I'm going to copy it over and hit play. Great. And now let's add a hi hat in between each kick drum. So, halfway in between each kick drum, we put a hi hat. Let's find ourselves a hi-hat that we like. I think it's going to be this one. And we're going to place it here, 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 and here. This is the starting point for our core drums. So let's hit play. All right. Boom, tsks, boom, tsks. That's the core bread and butter house music beat that you're going to be using variations of throughout your entire music production career. Now let's have a quick look at the volumes because I didn't adjust the volumes for any of this. So let's have a look at what the meters are saying. Ah, look at the clipping over here. That's bad practice. So we take the loudest element of our mix. Let's deactivate the others. We take the loudest element of our mix and make sure that we have some headroom above that. Like this, not too bad. And then add the other elements until they are the right volume compared to the loudest element of our mix. Approximately here. This is a good habit to start getting into the habit of because volumes, relative volumes, make a huge difference in how professional your music is going to sound in the long run. So get into the habit of setting the volume of your loudest element first, usually that's your kick drum, and then setting the relative volumes of everything next to it, making sure that your entire signal has some headroom. Okay, good habits. Now, back to arrangement view, and as I said, if these three elements are relatively predictable, and maybe you could even say this is a very boring pattern, well, it is the foundation upon which we can now create more interesting or more chaotic elements. So imagine I create another audio track, insert audio track like this, and I'm going to add in maybe a rim shot, right? And I'm going to explicitly not program the rim shot in any pattern consciously. I'm going to randomly copy paste this rim shot across this timeline. And you're going to see that compared to the metronome, it already sounds great. So I'm just going to copy paste this across. I don't know. I'm intentionally just not see. I'm even overwriting it a little bit. It's going to be a mess. I'm going to bring down the volume already down to like minus 12, 13. And let's hit play. See, after already three repetitions, I feel like this is a pattern that I could listen to for an entire song. It feels like I've got something predictable and then something a little bit chaotic going on. And together, they give the right level of interest. So if you make your music too predictable, it's going to be boring. If you make your music too chaotic, you're going to lose your audience. They won't be able to follow along. They won't be able to nod their head along. So you're going to need to find the right balance of predictability and unpredictability or complexity, simplicity and complexity to create contrast, to create things that have the right level of interest. This is going to be in your compositions, one of the main philosophical goals that you'll have to pursue throughout everything. So we'll come back to this a lot over time. And in drum programming, it's as simple as saying, what are my predictable drums and what are my additional drums that can do something a little bit more interesting? Let me add a second additional drum. For instance, let me add a clap here. Let me add this clap and let me add it at a somewhat random position as well. Let's see what this sounds like. Oh, and let's bring down the volume as well. Oh, it's matching the other pattern maybe a bit too much. Let's 
So as you can see, it starts to get more and more chaotic. So what was a too boring beat a moment ago suddenly becomes almost too complex. So there is a kind of a sweet spot there uh, that you need to figure out what you're comfortable with uh, in terms of complexity. Now, once things start to get a little bit more dense like this, let's simplify our life and get into the good habit of giving things names and colors. This is fundamental because beginning producers often forget to do this. However, at a certain point, you're going to say, you know what, I wish I could turn my hi-hat up two decibels. And then you look at your visual mess and you say, I don't know which of these tracks is my hi-hats. I have to go soloing each individual track until I find the hi-hat and then I can change it by two decibels or however many decibels I wanted to change it by. And that's just a waste of your mental energy. So whenever you start to get like more than three tracks, start getting into the habit of naming them. And so you just select up here, you hit Control R or Command R, and then you give it a name and you're going to call this the kick. And before hitting enter, don't hit enter yet, hit tab instead. And that's immediately going to switch to the next one. And then you can just go snare. And then you can go hi-hat and hit tab again and hit rib and hit tab again and call it clap. Excellent. Now they've all got names. Now let's give them colors. So let me select these three elements as my core drums. Right click them and make them red. And then let me do that again and right click them and do assign track color to clips. Hop. So now these three, I know these are my core drums because they're red and I can visually easily see where they are. And then these two other ones, I'm going to give them another color. I'm going to make them orange. I'm going to right click and do assign track color to clips. They're both orange and awesome. Now I've got myself a nicely color coded layout. You can also collapse and uncollapse these individual tracks. And if you hold down Alt on Windows, then you can collapse or uncollapse all of them. And yet another way of organizing this even better is selecting all of them and then doing group. So here, group tracks, Control G or Command G. Up. This creates a group around all of these drums, which we're going to call the drum group. And this now means that all of these audio channels are going to run first into the drum group and then into the master. And we can collapse the whole drum group like this and uncollapse it. So in our composition, we can make more tracks outside of the drum group. And this way we can just solo all of our drums or mute all of our drums at one go. They're all very nicely organized right here. This is a great way of organizing your session. and a great way to get started with a very efficient workflow. Now, before we call this drum loop finished, I want to draw your attention to one other feature of your DAW, which is up here in the top left corner, the beats per minute or tempo. It's the same thing. And what this is, is a little box that says how many beats are there in one minute. And so right now we've got 120 beats per minute. That's almost, well, that's exactly two beats per second. That means that the bass drum goes one, two, every half a second. So it hits every half a second. So we can almost count the clock with this. We can go one, two, one, two, one, two, right? And so if we want to speed up our composition, all we've got to do is click here and drag up or click here and type in an exact number. And so whenever you're thinking about house music, I'm going to use a lot of house music examples here because it's a very sort of safe genre in the sense that it has a lot of conventions and we can I can easily teach you how to do a kind of a generic house song. Use this as the basis to go off onto whatever genre you're most attracted to. So don't feel limited to house. But forgive me for using a lot of house examples. But a lot of house music sits somewhere in the 125 to 130 beats per minute range. Above that and it starts to feel like very fast house. Uh, below that and it starts to feel like very slow house. Below that even further is where you'll find a lot of the hip hop tempos and above that is where you'll find tempos for things like dubstep, drum and bass, all these other genres where the beat goes faster. So whenever you're doing a composition, choose relatively early on in the process what your beats per minute is going to be. Because in a lot of electronic music, the beats per minute doesn't change for the entirety of the track. 
if your song is at 130 beats per minute, it stays at 130 beats per minute. This allows a DJ to mix your song in with another song and it's going to synchronize up very nicely. If your song changes tempo in the middle of the song, DJs are going to stay away from it because it's kind of an unwritten rule. Sometimes if you want your song to feel like it's speeding up or slowing down, you can instead program more drum hits on the same grid or less drum hits on the same grid. So you might have, for instance, a beat that's going at 140 beats per minute. Let me hit that, 140. And it sounds like this. But then you can delete every second kick drum. And it feels like it's going at half time. So this is another way of making your songs feel like they're speeding up or slowing down without actually changing the beats per minute. Only change the beats per minute in your composition if you are 100% sure you know that that's what you want to do because usually you don't want to do it. There are a few art pieces out there in the world who do it. For instance, I always think of Ohm Sweet Ohm by Kraftwerk as a song that starts really slow and then speeds up at the end. It's beautiful, that's a great composition, but it will be very hard to play that in a DJ set. So think about that in your composition, what your goal is, and consider choosing your BPM carefully up front and then leaving it there for the entirety of your composition. Now another small music theory note about rhythm when we said downbeat, upbeat, backbeat, right? So as we said in this composition, you would describe this beat as the downbeat, this beat as the upbeat, and this beat as both a downbeat and a backbeat, right? That's all fine. However, realize that the downbeats and the upbeats and the backbeats are an abstract moment in your music, not an actual sound. So this is a bass drum, and when I delete the bass drum, this is still a downbeat your head still goes down at this moment in time, right? So even if I delete two of these bass drums, you will still feel the downbeats there. So if you nod your head along with the composition, it's still at very fast. Let me slow it down a little bit. Let me go back to 124, let's say. See how you keep nodding, even though there's no kick drums there? That means that that is the downbeat. So the downbeat is an abstract moment. The bass drum is just an instrument that happens to play on the downbeat, almost coincidentally. It marks the downbeat, right? But it isn't the same thing as the downbeat. It's just that the downbeat is on that moment and the bass drum happens to play on that moment. One more interface thing that I want to show you as well is instead of deleting audio files when you want to like just see what it sounds like without this kick drum instead of deleting it you can instead hit zero on your number pad up, and that deactivates the clip this is very handy if you want to just deactivate uh, a sound for a moment just so to get it out of your way and then bring it back in so you don't forget that something was supposed to be there so zero on your number pad that's another one you want to add to your keyboard shortcut hot list all right, so take that away with you now and do this as a homework. Create yourself some drum beats using the three core elements. So a low percussion, a mid percussion and a high percussion. That's going to be a bass drum, a hi-hat, and then in the mids it's going to be a snare, a rim shot or a clap. Those are going to be your core elements. Then add some additional percussion, put them in a nicely organized group, give them names, color them, make sure their volumes are playing at the right volume, see that you like it, find the right balance between predictability and complexity, do a few iterations of this because this is going to become a core skill for you in the future as well. In the next class, we're going to revisit this, but we're going to use a new technology to program a very similar thing. But first I wanna get you really comfortable working with audio, putting little fades on things, copy pasting audio across. These are core skills that we're gonna be coming back to again and again and again. See you all in the next class. Thank <laughs> you.